Sri Lanka is going through one of the worst crises any country has seen in recent times. Over the past several years, this island nation of 22 million people off the coast of India has seen chronic shortages of food and medicine, leading to starvation and rioting. There have been energy blackouts, business collapses, shattered schools, a government debt default, and hyperinflation that peaked above 67%. It all culminated in the summer of 2022 when protesters broke into the presidential palace and forced the country's president, Gotabaya Rajapeska, to flee the country. Today, in the spring of 2023, things are calming down and the international community is beginning to come to Sri Lanka's rescue. But what happened to Sri Lanka? As recently as five years ago, it was considered a success story. Sri Lanka has one of the best educated workforces in Asia, and its literacy rate is higher than many developed countries. Between 2003 and 2012, its economy grew at a pace of 6.4%, one of the fastest growth rates in Asia. Though it may sound strange at first, Sri Lanka's growth was the wrong kind of growth. And what happened to this country is a cautionary tale for other countries about what can happen when a government tries to grow the economy too quickly and when politicians make promises they can't keep. But before we go any further, make sure to hit the subscribe button to get notifications on the latest economic news and analysis. And if you like this video, hit the like button and help us spread the word. For centuries, Sri Lanka, known previously as Ceylon, was a major trading hub. Located off the southern coast of India, it was perfectly situated to be a stop for ships trading between east and west. Sri Lanka traded with China as early as 400 BCE. But starting in the 1500s, Sri Lanka, or at least parts of it, fell into the hands of various European colonial powers. First the Portuguese, then the Dutch, and eventually the British. For centuries, the country saw little economic progress. When it gained independence in 1948, Sri Lanka followed a similar path to its neighbor India, creating a semi-socialist economy with the government as the central player. For Sri Lanka, being independent was a big deal. The country had an aversion to being independent on foreign imports, and its government followed a policy of import substitution. It placed high tariffs on foreign goods, or even sometimes banned them in order to encourage local versions of those imports to be produced. But the country had neither the capital nor the skills to replicate at home all the goods produced internationally. For decades, it remained relatively poor, though still wealthier than some other Asian countries like Thailand and Indonesia. In 1977, a new government came into power and began shifting the country away from socialist policies and towards free market reforms. The government began deregulating industries and privatizing its state-owned companies. New industries began to grow. Sri Lanka became known as a center of food processing, textiles, and apparel. It also developed its telecommunications and financial industries. The country's middle class began to grow. But that progress was cut short in the 1990s when a civil war erupted between the government and the Tamil Tigers, a partisan group that wanted to create an independent state for Sri Lanka's Tamil minority in the northeast part of the island. The civil war raged for 26 years, putting a halt to the country's economic progress. Only in 2009, when the government declared victory over the Tamil Tigers, was Sri Lanka once again able to focus on its future and its economy. In the years after the war, things improved by leaps and bounds. Sri Lanka has beautiful beaches and rainforests, which began attracting tourists. It developed an export economy, with tea being its major export. But in the long run, it would turn out that much of the growth that happened after 2009 was misguided. Old habits die hard, and Sri Lanka's aversion to foreign trade continued. The government invested heavily in non-tradable goods, meaning goods that can't be sold in exchange for other things. Many of these investments were a good idea to an extent. For instance, the government built infrastructure, such as roads and deep water ports. Schools and new homes popped up. Those things are good for the economy. They make the economy more efficient and allow businesses to become more productive. But investing in infrastructure works only up to a point. Once you've built enough, there's no economic benefit to building more, and that's the situation Sri Lanka got itself into. Plenty of infrastructure, but not enough businesses to use it. What's more, all this infrastructure building was done through debt. At this time, the government was borrowing heavily, and it was paying high interest rates. In earlier times, Sri Lanka largely borrowed from other governments or through programs designed to help underdeveloped countries. The interest rates on those loans were relatively low, but in the post-2009 era, Sri Lanka borrowed money on the open markets where interest rates were much higher. Although it was growing, Sri Lanka was still seen as a risky place to invest, in no small part because of the decades of civil war that it went through. Investors will only take a risk investing in a place like Sri Lanka if they can get a very high return on their investment. For this reason, Sri Lanka paid much higher interest rates on its loans than other, more stable countries. 
The idea behind borrowing to build infrastructure is that once the infrastructure is in place, your businesses are more productive and pay higher taxes. That higher revenue allows the government to pay off the debts it took on. Sri Lanka may have had a quickly growing economy, but it wasn't quick enough to keep up with the interest payments on its debt. Between 2003 and 2023, the interest rate in Sri Lanka averaged 7.9%, but its economic growth was 6.4%. What this meant was that Sri Lanka's debt kept getting larger and larger. Making things worse was that national leaders made extravagant promises at every election. The people of Sri Lanka were often promised things such as lower bread prices, subsidized rice, free fertilizer for farmers, salary increases for government employees, and tax cuts. All of this meant that the country's debt kept growing and growing. Though its government and people didn't realize it, the Sri Lankan economy was becoming a house of cards, and sooner or later, a breeze would come by that would knock it down. That breeze began to blow in 2019. On Easter Sunday, April 21, terrorists linked to ISIS carried out suicide bombings at three churches and three luxury hotels in the capital city of Colombo. In all, 269 people were killed, including 45 foreign nationals. In the wake of the bombing, Sri Lanka's tourism industry began to suffer. Foreigners no longer considered the country safe, and one of Sri Lanka's main sources for external revenue began to shrink. A year later, the COVID-19 pandemic struck and Sri Lanka's tourism industry ground to a complete halt. The timing couldn't have been worse. Just months earlier, in November of 2019, Sri Lankans elected a new government under President Gotabayan Rajapaska. He had promised deep tax cuts on the argument that they would bring foreign investment and strengthen the country's consumers. But Sri Lanka already had very low taxes. Many economists argued its taxes were in fact too low. Even prior to the tax cuts, income taxes were so low that only 2% of the population were required to pay any income tax at all. The total tax burden in Sri Lanka before the tax cuts amounted to 12% of GDP. That's far lower than any advanced economy. By comparison, the U.S., which has one of the lowest tax burdens among developed countries, collects 26.6% of GDP in taxes. It's hard to imagine how Sri Lanka's government expected to pay for its years of infrastructure building without collecting the taxes needed to cover debt payments. But Rajapaska's new government not only ignored the problem, they made it worse. His tax cuts reduced government revenues to just 8% of GDP. When the pandemic hit, government revenues dried up. The government had been dependent not only on tourism, but on foreign remittances. Sri Lankans working abroad who sent money home to their families. With many countries in lockdown, those Sri Lankans lost their jobs or had their hours cut. The money flowing into Sri Lanka slowed way down. To pay for services, the government began to drain its reserves. At the end of 2019, before the pandemic, Sri Lanka had the equivalent of 7.6 billion US dollars in its reserves. By the spring of 2023, that had shrunk to just 250 million. Simply put, Sri Lanka ran out of money. People could see that this was happening and began to lose faith in the local currency. The Sri Lankan rupee began to fall against other currencies and inflation began to rise. Prior to the pandemic, inflation in Sri Lanka typically ran between 2 and 5 percent. By the middle of 2022, it peaked at above 67 percent. Today, in the spring of 2023, it's still hovering at around 40 percent. In the middle of all of this, the government did something very foolish. It banned the import of fertilizers. Since Sri Lanka doesn't produce any of its own fertilizer, a ban on imports effectively meant a total ban on fertilizers. President Rajapaska sold this as an environmental policy. The goal was to make Sri Lankan farming organic and to reduce the nitrogen emissions that came from fertilizers. But without modern fertilizers, the cost of producing food in Sri Lanka jumped tenfold. Food production almost immediately dropped by 50%. Many in the West point to this as a cautionary example of the dangers of going green. But in Sri Lanka, it was more than that. It was also traditional Sri Lankan protectionism rearing its head once again. Importing fertilizer cost the Sri Lankan economy $400 million per year, and the government was trying to keep money from draining out of the country. Whatever the real reasons behind the policy, the result was clear. People began to starve. Mass riots exploded in the streets. In July of 2022, rioters broke into the presidential palace in Colombo, forcing President Rajapaska to flee the country. He had already resigned the month before. Today, less than a year after Rajapaska fled the country, things are beginning to calm down, and signs are emerging that for Sri Lankans, the worst of the crisis is behind them. In March of this year, the IMF agreed to a $3 billion bailout. The World Bank is planning to kick in another $600 million. Current forecasts are for the Sri Lankan economy to shrink by 2-3% to this year, but that's far better than the record 7.8% contraction the country saw in 2022. 
Maybe most importantly, signs are emerging that the government is learning from its mistakes. Earlier this year, it introduced an income tax for higher earners at a rate between 12.5% and 36%. It also raised some other taxes to pay for the import of essential goods like food and fuel. For the first time in a long time, Sri Lanka might actually raise enough revenue to pay for the spending that it does. The country's experiment in big borrowing and high spending on unnecessary infrastructure has proven to be a catastrophic failure. Maybe the next time around, it will be a little wiser with its money. If you like this video, please hit the like button, which helps us spread the word about this channel. And don't forget to click on subscribe to get notifications about our latest videos. And click one of the videos here to learn more about the economic debacles unfolding in the world today. Thank you for watching.